Beyond the Nim Wars by Aesthetics. No applause? Come on. Cool. Uh, before I start, um, I just want to thank everyone at ShmooCon, all the ShmooCon staff for putting this together, because conferences are hard to do. So can we get a big round of applause for all of them? All right. Cool. And if anybody here is not having a good time, can you raise your hand? Okay, that guy needs to be taken out and shot. <laughs> all right, fair enough. Smack him over the head with a beer bottle. That's right. Uh, Cool. Well, welcome to Beyond Nimwars, and thank you all for coming to the talk. I will get into a whole bunch of stuff, and by the way, I have a lot of material. I'm going to do my best to keep it within time, and if I run out of time with no time for questions, I'll probably be up in the lobby, so feel free to come up and um, ask me things later. And if I seem to gloss over some parts of it, that's why. It's not because... Uh, feel free to come up and ask follow-up questions, please, because this is... It's becoming a life passion for me, as we'll see. Uh, I, I want to open up with a couple of quick questions. First, how many people here have a name? What about you guys? You're not raising your hands. You don't have names? Okay, so, so my next question, who here does not have a name? What is this, Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat or something? Come on. Okay, and you're all numbers, okay, yeah. And my third question, does anyone here have a name they've given themselves? About half the crowd, okay, more than I thought. Great. And by the way, this is my own artwork. I spent about an hour in Photoshop uh, learning a bunch of different things. So if it sucks, blame me. Uh, it's, it's this juxtapose of Darth Vader, the evil empire, and, and Anonymous. And by the way, I assume everyone here has heard of Anonymous? Anybody who hasn't? No, they're anonymous. <laughs> they're anonymous, yeah, exactly. Okay. So here's another entity. I'm curious if ever anyone's heard of Google. Um, there's a lot of great things about Google, and no, this talk is not ragging about Google completely, just, just so you know. Um, there, there's, there's a lot of great things that they do, and one of the things they did this past, actually it was two years ago, I guess, so summer, July of 2011, they introduced this thing called Google+. Plus. Has everyone heard of it, Google+, Plus? anyone who hasn't? Okay, it's a unifying social network competing with Facebook, all this other stuff. Let me just see if I can raise this up a little bit. Is this better? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Okay, good. And Google Plus seemed to be an answer to all kinds of things. Um, I hate Facebook, I don't know about you guys, and I wanted to see something come along and take down Facebook. I was really, really excited, and I was advocating and all these people use it, and then this happened to me. Uh, I, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but it basically says, after reviewing your profile, we determined that the name you provided violates our community standards, is what they called it, right? And this is how I discovered this thing called the real names policy. And but by the way, just to show how together Google was at this time, the, the link there was a dead link. It was a 404. <laughs> Figures, right? So that's kind of where I got the inspiration and start looking at all these different facets of identity and where things break, where they work, and um, you know, maybe try to rally people and have discussions about it. So I, I don't know that I necessarily have any answers for you guys, but I can share things that I've learned, my experiences that I've had. And as you see up in the upper right corner, I've helped form a group called NIMRITES, where we want to get people to discuss this stuff and see what does identity mean to every one of you. And that's kind of the point of all this. So the thesis statements of this talk. Number one, identity is prismatic or multifaceted. Number two, and I... This is something that's become a real passion of mine. There's no such thing as a real name. Legal names, sure. Real name, I think, is actually a dangerous concept. And third, imposing, as I'll show with evidence, uh, imposing a singular identity is not only harmful, it doesn't work. So th there, there's kind of an institutional effort to push people into a single name right now. And th there's some issues that I have with it. In any case, has anyone here heard of NISTIC or NSTIC? I call it NISTIC. A few people, okay, great. So NISTIC is known as the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. <clears throat> Just got back from lunch. And it's kind of this initiative by the Obama administration to try to address the challenges that we're looking at right now. Like how many people know that passwords are totally broken? <laughs> okay, good. Has anybody here been compromised because of a weak password? Okay, you guys are honest, that's good. And w one of the things that we've seen, especially in the last two years with Anonymous and LulzSec and all the password dumps, is that classically we've had tools like the brute force and, you know, through, through, through brute force and passwords and such. But now with like two, three million dumps of passwords and the strat for emails and such, 
the people who are writing these tools actually have real life passwords that they can work from and construct patterns from and figure out how people actually create their passwords. Like for example, how many of you know somebody who has a password that's their dog's name or something? <laughs> right. And there's all kinds of other issues, identity theft and things like that. In fact, NISTIC has a whole bunch of different working groups or committees as they call them. They address security, privacy, management, outreach, things like that. And well, I came along and I'm like, wow, this looks really interesting. We should uh, make sure that they know about NIMS and NIM rights and all that other stuff and, and, and names and how they work because it turned out they hadn't really addressed all of that. So there was a plenary that happened a couple weeks ago. And I, I went to the, on the 5th of February, it was 5th through 7th of February. And I got to have, a, we, we had a four hour long discussion about NIM rights and how names could work into this government initiative. Because uh, how, how many people see that and think like fucking scary real ID or you know, tracking and stuff like that? How many get freaked out when they see that? Right, all of you need to join and make sure that doesn't happen. And we'll, we'll get into that more in a second. And by the way, I, I, I'm going to cover some basic myths of identity and things that people think about pseudonymous and anonymous identities. All of those myths that I will cover were things that were brought up in the discussion. So it's not just like I'm bringing up straw men because it's convenient to make my points. I had to make all of these points at the plenary a couple weeks ago with the people who are in charge of trying to figure this out for you know, the government and the private sector and everything else. So just keep that in mind. So where does NIMRITES fit in a NISTIC? We, we got, I like to call these the threat levels, right? You got the top threat level, which is, it, I guess, the threat level yellow, the, the super happy one, the green one, right? Where you have where we fit in. We're trying to have open discussions with governments and corporations and figure out how can we set things up to make sure that everyone's perspective agency is respected. And then you have the, the middle level there, the lawful intercept, uh, you know, NSA surveillance, things like that. And then you have the third level, the crazy NSA state surveillance. So the third level, aka threat level red, whatever you want to call it, that is what a lot of people think of when they hear you know, national strategy for trusted identities in cyberspace. They hear rigid, horrible things and real ID and tracking and all this other stuff. And that's what we're trying to make sure doesn't happen. So the problem with that, I don't know how you guys can see this. I'll have these slides up online later. On the left side right there, that's the current makeup of the NISTIC community. The tall purple thingy you see is the big corporations that are involved in it. And it's about 500 representatives there. And on the right, the, the little tiny green sliver is the regular people. And this could mean privacy groups like the EFF and EPIC. That could be like somebody like me. I have joined as Aesthetics as a member of NISTIC, which means anybody can do it, right? You don't even have to be a US citizen. I'm serious. This is, a lot of people just don't realize this. And what we're trying to do with this outreach, see the one on the right, see how it's like 5,000 on the green side of all the ordinary regular people, and you know maybe it's still 500 corporations. It's not that anything bad or malicious is happening, it's just we need to make sure people's voices are heard. So think about this as we go through, that these are really, really important discussions. If identity is important to you, then this might be something you're interested in. So myth number one, and there are five of these myths, just so you know. Only pedophiles, criminals, and cyberbullies do not want to use their legal names online. Also, what is a NIM? And we're joined by Adam Savage, who's going to help us you know, debunk some of these myths. So well, let's take a look at what is a name, right? And NIMs versus names, things like that. Uh, these are just some typical ID type things, all these little documents. Some of them are government, some of them are not. How many people here have uh, three or more of these IDs? Right, OK. And the other interesting thing I want to point out is that if, let's say that you have all five of these, uh, your name on each of them can be different and valid at the same time. And that tells you a bit about how these systems all work together or don't work together. An example that I have used, uh, I have a legal first and last name and I had a boarding pass when I was flying from Europe to America for, I think I was at a conference or something, and the plane, the, the flight screwed up the name so there was no space, so it was all one word, and I came into Border Patrol and they tried to scan it and it broke the system, it didn't work. <laughs> because it was looking for the compartmentalization and it just, it couldn't stomach it. So, and the, well, yeah, server fail. So the guy had to sit there and manually type it and I kind of felt bad for him, but he was an asshole to me, so fuck him, right? <laughs> So, 
these are, the, and, and I started thinking more about what is a name and how does it relate to identity? And I think one important thing is that they're not the same thing. And I define here as a la name, as a label or symbol that's used to identify person, thing, or concept within a context. And up on the left there, you see Adam naming the animals. And if anybody has studied Genesis at all, Adam names the animals and thus he has a degree of power over them. In term, and, and there's also some discussion about the Adamic language, the language that was spoken inside of the Garden of Eden and the true name of God and all that other stuff. And uh, later on in Genesis, you have something even more interesting, which is the Tower of Babel, where God comes along, or Yahweh, I should say, the Old Testament God, and destroys the language and makes everyone speak in a different tongue, thus destroying the Tower of Babel. So if you don't think names have any power, I would take a look at Genesis. And on the right there, you have uh, the royal seal to make sure it came from the king. So names can be used for authentication too, or symbols, I should say. Here's some uh, various nom de plume. Nom de plume is another form of word for pseudonym. We'll get into etymology in a minute, but nom de plume literally means feather name. So I'm guessing in DC, how many people here know who Publius was? Okay, wow. So besides the Roman century and whatnot, Publius was the name that was on all the Federalist papers that were, uh, okay, yeah. It, it, it was a name, there were three main authors of the Federalist paper. It was, was it James Madison, John Jay, and I always forget the third. Does anybody know? Hamilton. What? Hamilton, yes, thank you. And they wrote basically documents, that they wrote letters to these newspapers to defend the Constitution and make sure it would get ratified under the pseudonym of Publius. Uh, J.K. Rowling, anyone heard of her? You know why that's a pseudonym, by the way? Because um, her name is Joan Rowling. She doesn't have a middle name, and the publisher didn't want to publish a book by a woman and made her come up with a gender-neutral name, at, like she added the K. The K is just made up for the book. <laughs> Nicholas Bourbaki is an interesting one. It was a group of, I think, French mathematicians in the 1930s who tried to write mathematics from the ground up. And uh, one of my favorites here, um, Ian Donald Calvin Euclid Zappa. Anybody know this story? Because they say that, the, you know, your parents name you, right? So Frank Zappa, anyone heard of Frank Zappa? <laughs> right. Because he named his kids like Dweezil and Moon Unit, right? So Frank Zappa was in the hospital and they, they gave birth to Dweezil and the nurse is like, okay, what name do you want to give your kid? And they're like, Dweezil. And the nurse is like, no. <laughs> Use a real name, right? So what Frank did is he just sat there and he listed off like four random names of musicians he knew and the nurse put that down on the birth certificate. So move along five years later and they'd been calling him Dweezil all along and the kid turns five and he discovers that the name on his birth certificate is that and he's like, fuck no, my name is Dweezil and he had his name at five years old legally changed to Dweezil. <laughs> so. Some other points here, Richard Bachman, a.k.a. Stephen King, you have Deep Throat, who is purported to be Mark Felt. That was all about the whole Watergate. What's that? He admitted it. He, he, oh, he admitted it, okay. Mark Felt in the, in the Watergate stuff. Voltaire, who published Candide, and the King of France wanted to kill the author of it, but couldn't. Uh, George Eliot, anyone know that? George Eliot's uh, legal, actual name is Marianne Evans. It was a woman who couldn't get published as a man, just like the Bronte sisters who published under male pseudonyms because they couldn't get published as women. That sex, that, that's really interesting, isn't it? Turns out there's an entire Wikipedia section on female writers who wrote under male or gender neutral pseudonyms. That's kind of fucked up, isn't it? <laughs> so let, let's move on along a little bit and like ask some questions about why names matter. And I think I spelled Valerie's name wrong, but the CIA uh, employee who was outed, what's that? Uh, instead of I-M, it should be M. Oh, it should be M, okay. Instead of I, plan, okay, so, right. Um, also, you have things like the Witness to Protection Program, and that most people would consider that a valid pseudonym, a pseudonym being a uh, cover or a shield. Uh, anybody remember the Odysseus and the Cyclops story? where he tries to escape the Cyclops' cave and the Cyclops asks, who are you? And he says, my name is no one. So then he stabs the guy in the eye, the Cyclops in the eye, and he escapes and the Cyclops, oh, come, people, come help me, something horrible is happening. And they say, well, who, who did this to you? No one. And they're like, what the hell? <laughs> so, I don't know, this, this is a very old thing. And then things like the AOL and Netflix databases, which they tried to anonymize the data they put out, this was a few years ago, and it turned out that people were able to take the search histories and collect them together and determine who the people were. So, interesting things to think about. 
Couple definitions here, a social network, I call that a force that brings people or their personas, so it could be your IRC or AM screen names or something like that, together on a regular basis. A friend is a person that you would choose to be in contact with, and really, really important in this discussion, an institution is a custom practice relationship or significant behavior within a social network. And when I mean institution, I also think of phrases like institutionalized oppression, and I'm sure people here are familiar with that term. So moving on a little bit and getting into some psychology here, the question, is identity internal or external? Anyone? Yes, okay, good. And if you've studied Freud at all, you may be familiar with the concepts of id, ego, and superego, the id being the carnal beast nature of man, the ego being the intellect and the superego, the relations between all of us. And um, this gets into questions like reputation. We'll address this uh, in a bit in the talk. And has anyone here seen Citizen Kane, the movie? Got a few people. Yeah, the thing that I really like about Citizen Kane is that it's a movie where the main character dies in the beginning and the whole movie is trying to piece together who he is and what he was getting on about. And it's kind of creating this integral of who he was based on other people's perceptions of him. So gathering who he was based on external perceptions. So um, interesting things to think about. And then of course Oscar Wilde, who's also a jackass and misogynist, but really funny, snippy, witty guy. So the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. So. One of Freud's students is Carl Jung, somebody who I've studied a great deal and I admire his work, defines identity in kind of two realms. You have the conscious and unconscious, or the rational and emotional, right? So the rational, you have math, logic, set theory, things like that, and words. And they're, they're all definitions, right? And then on the unconscious, it's emotion and group dynamics and feeling. And this is really, really important to think about when you're thinking about names and you're thinking about defining words, because what is a definition but what you think a word means and how, like, the, the common language, right? That's why common language is so important. And Jung has this other idea of collective unconscious as well, which is the mood of a room. How do you know when somebody's upset and how do you know just the general vibe? So th these are really, really important ideas. So, so, so to revisit that for a second, you have a word, you have the definition of the word, and then you have the meaning of it. So the definition could be the word itself. Like, uh, I don't know, happy. What does happy mean, right? Words are tricky things, you know, word salad. Humans are really finicky things, beings. So I was thinking about this, how could this work within tech? And this is something I've been thinking about for a while. And what I realized is that, because we're all online, right? We all use Twitter and Facebook. Well, I don't use Facebook, fuck them. But uh, <laughs> one of the things I realized here, and it's kind of capstone, label, it's hard to see that. It says labels help define relationships. So what you have there is that yin yang that we just saw, the Jungian, identity model. And then you have the relationship between Twitter, which is also, I consider that a, a, a social group or a social network of sorts. And then that label or the name that appears on it is the way that we define or describe the relationship that I have with it. And another one there you can see is the driver's license. And the important element to remember here is that when we talk about personas, we talk about facets of somebody's personality. And when we label them, it's kind of like a prism, right? You have all the different colors that you label, and then you discover there's more colors within them, and it's, it's very integral, right? I think identity works the same way, and names are simply labels for all these relationships we have with each other. Something else I want to point out, you can see they're labeled A, B, C, and D. And D, there's this uh, subset right there where the driver's license uh, for John Smith is relationship C because it's, that's the name describing that relationship with the government, the legal relationship. For D, your friends and family call you Jack, which one could say is derived from the legal name that you have, or the family name in some cases. Uh, does anybody know the origin of the phrase nickname, by the way? It's, uh, I think it's Celtic. It's, it, it literally means additional name, which means that there's a base name, too. It means a name that's extended away from the original one. So back to what nims are. We've talked about names a lot, right? So I'm defining a pseudonym. And by the way, when we say NIMS, we usually mean that truncated NYM part at the end of pseudonym. That's what most people think about. I believe it's much, much more than that. We're still having this vocabulary discussion within NIMS, right? So this is my opinions. So I define a pseudonym as a name that is often used to hide a base name. And base name is very important. You have the, you know, the, the original one and then hide it w with a shield or something else. Witness protection program is an example of that. A polyonym is a name consistent of multiple words or symbols. So Charles Foster Kane or you know, Dave Brown, something like that. A mononym is a name of just one word or symbol. So it could be Charles, it could be David, whatever. An autonym is something I really, really like. And it's, you have to differentiate autonym from pseudonym, by the way. Autonym is a name bestowed upon oneself. 
Does anybody here have an autonym? Few people. Okay, cool. And an anonym is a name representing anonymity. And this is something that uh, I often refer to if you've ever used Slashdot. When you uh, make an account and you make a comment without logging in, you're branded as an anonymous coward. So just some basic definitions there. And one of the core elements of this talk, why not use a real name? What's wrong with that word? So actually, first off, anybody, what's the opposite of real? All right, and you know what the etymology of pseudonym is, right? Pseudo is Greek for fake or uh, artificial and such. And when we think of real and fake, we think of almost belonging and not belonging. And there's kind of a, a negative implication with that word real or with things that are not considered real. And you know, which is more valid, which is more legitimate, those are words I'll get to in a bit. There's also a lack of agency. How many people have you chose what your name is? Okay, a few. Right, so you didn't even have a choice. What the fuck, right? And maybe you're okay with that, but you should at least think about it. Easily substituted with better alternatives, I think given name, I think birth name, legal name, those, those are all totally fine. Those, those also represent and compartmentalize the ideas of names into something very different from real. And each of those are all considered real. I, I, I'd say every name is real myself. And there, I could give an entire talk on the, where, where the concept of a real name comes from. The earliest origin that I have found of it is um, English common law starting with Henry VIII. I want to say in like 1120, 1150, somewhere in there. What's that? Oh, what's that? Oh, it's 1400s? Okay. I can't remember right now. Because uh, it was Henry II and Thomas Becket and all that stuff. And that was early? Okay. Oh, 1200s, okay. We have DuckDuckGo for a reason. That's okay. <laughs> but common law, because they were running into this problem where the, basically we had all these little communities and we're trying to figure out property rights. So they had used common law to unite everything. And how are you going to tell who owns what? Well, they need to have a name, right? And if, there, there's other examples where this comes in. Uh, the people who survived the plague, the reformation of the Catholic Church, all, the, all these other elements are where, and of course the discovery of the new world. And if you're interested in that topic, it's beautiful, it's, it's a brilliant topic. There was a talk given at the conference 28C3 called What's in a Name? So I recommend going to that. And we can talk later after that if you want. So another thing that I wanna go over are just what social networks are in general. Is anybody here familiar with Joseph Campbell? Got a few people, great. Um, you, you, let me ask, has anyone here seen Star Wars? <laughs> okay, George Lucas credits Joseph Campbell on the hero's journey with the creation of this, what, what Star Wars was about. So you, you have the ideas, uh, and this is older than Campbell, by the way, the right-hand path and left-hand path. The right-hand path is the institutionalization, the structure that you brought up, you were brought up in, the culture you come from. Maybe it's the store down the street, the people that you knew, the way that you speak, the, 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 the way that, it, do you shake hands or bow, right? That, that's all considered kind of the, the way things are supposed to be, the right-hand path. And then the left-hand path, which is also known as kind of the hero's journey, is when you go off into those realms of self-discovery. So you can see on the uh, circle here, you have, um, you have a guy, and there's a call to action, call to adventure. It could be, you know, Neo gets the phone call, follow the white rabbit. It could be, and then you go a little bit longer, and you get, um, what does it say there? You often get uh, aides to work with, so Luke gets the lightsaber, and then the, and you go along, you have challenges, you, you get a mentor maybe, so I think it was the Oracle or Obi-Wan Kenobi, and you keep going until there's the abyss, and you get all these challenges as you run through them, and then you come to the atonement, which is, the at one, bringing everything back together within itself and then you return because you're the same person, right? <laughs> exactly, so th th that's something really, really interesting. I don't have time to go through all of this. I could give an entire talk on just this. I do wanna focus on that question, why do hacker handles matter? Anybody have an idea? Attribution. Okay, attribution is one thing. W more within the context of the hero's journey idea. What do you think? You're choosing your own identity, sure. One, one of the examples I've given to illustrate this point is uh, everyone here knows what privileges are, I assume. I consider a name to be what I call an invisible privilege. So if you see, the, if somebody has a long nose and you make fun of them, well, that's a visible privilege. I consider a name an invisible privilege. So for example, how many of you have ever worn a tie to work? You know how everyone treats you differently when you have that tie on? It, it affects the mood, it affects the social network that you have. I run into this, if I introduce people by a name that they recognize as one of theirs, like, what if I introduced myself as Joseph Campbell and they didn't know who it was, right? 
Well, I would get treated very differently than introducing myself as aesthetics. And that's something to just kind of think about. Why it is that we do that? And, and this whole idea of what's normal and, and where these social norms come from. And that gets into Joseph Campbell's ideas. So, and, and one last thing on, on this myth I want to cover. Uh, you guys know about J Zuko's triangle? Really fascinating. Uh, they come from Zuko Wilcox, and he's a cryptographer. 30 minutes. Okay, thank you. Oh, fuck, I have so much more to get through. And the, the general idea here is that you have these three attributes uh, for a digital name, a name on a digital system. A uh, name can be global, securely unique, or memorable, right? And you can have two out of th three. You can't have all three. And that's, that's Zuko's uh, t triangle paradigm. And if you want to understand this a bit better, the, the, there's the uh, analogous you, uh, fast, cheap, and good. You can't have all three. You can get, have two of the three, right? Uh, an example that has been given for this are domain names where you can have like say abc.com, shmoocon.org. Well, that's global because everyone can access it from the URL, right? It's memorable, everyone remembers that. It's not really secure from like phishing attacks and things like that. So it, it, more, more paradigm things. And, and these are the caveats that we run into as we try to integrate all these contexts together, which is what the names are all about. So number two for the myths, thanks Adam. We can stop cyberbullying by forcing people to use their legal names. People who do not use their legal names do not contribute positively to discussions. I, God, I had, had like a freaking hour-long argument with the guy about this at Nystic. Very, very nice guy, but very, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're working on him, right? So, I, did anybody see this? This was the Violent Takers, the Reddit Gawker guy. Um, he was creating basically this subreddit called Jailbait, where they were posting photos of underage women. Fully clothed, mind you, it just had that label jailbait on it. And th there was also some uh, boundaries issues, and they were using the photos without permission, things like that. I mean, I'd be pretty pissed off if, if I was on that or if my daughter were on that or something like that, wouldn't you guys? So here, here's the, the issue. Like, I'm not saying that the guy isn't a douchebag. Violent Acres is the name, and his, his legal name is Michael Bruch. It, it, I mean, this was all outed. And I think it's fantastic that there was ju some kind of justice brought to it, right? Because it's like community standards and social things. The one issue that I really have with Adrian's article is that it didn't draw the distinction that, how to put it, he, it's not because he used that name, Violent Acres, that he did these horrible things. It's because he's a douchebag that he did these horrible things. Because a lot of people, the only time we see this in the news is when somebody is freaking pedophiles, child molesters, criminals, things like that. Those are the only times these names ever pop up in the news, and thus many people, it's the only exposure to them. There's a lot of other folks who use them and you know, to, to have general common discourse. That's why I use Publius in the example, right? So I'm, I'm just putting that out there, disambiguate, douchebaggery from names, right? V very important distinction. So next, you have Amanda Todd. Did any of you guys see this? This came up in the news the same week as that. So this was absolutely horrible, very, very tragic story. This girl, she was 15 years old, and she was cyberbullied and killed herself because of it. Uh, incredible. And if you get a chance, go see this video. It's about eight minutes long, and it covers uh, hor horrible things that they did to her. But the challenge was all of her cyberbullies were bullying her on Facebook. And if I recall, Facebook has a real names policy. And yet this kept coming up, and people saying, oh, we can't use pseudonyms, right? Well, wait a second, that doesn't actually matter here. So cyberbullying is horrible, and you know, we, we definitely do need to work on it, but it has nothing to do in this context with names. So I assume you guys know about Anonymous, or maybe you don't. There's a, there's a number of ways I've described Anonymous, and the examples here I use are kind of the hive mind. You think emergent properties and mimetics. Mimetics are really important here because they're the only structure you have everyone following the, the top of the hierarchy, which is just an idea. And over here, does anybody recognize the photo on the left? Phineas Gage. And uh, yeah, F Phineas was a railroad worker. Spike went through his brain in like the 1850s, I think. And he stayed alive. He lived 10 years on after the accident. His personality changed, though. And I think that, that, that it's really indicative of kind of the larger scope of how humanity works together. We have this notion of the hive mind, right? Which is kind of what Anonymous is. And what happens, how do people try to stop Anonymous? They try to take somebody out and you know, tweak them a little bit, maybe put them through some clockwork orange therapy and reintroduce them into the system. Or, oh my god, there's all these trolls, so let's try to you know, stamp that out and you know, force them to use their Facebook name, something like that. Well, it turns out that that doesn't actually work at all. So the first reason is, to address the first uh, issue with it, it's kind of Heisenberg uncertainty principle, Schrodinger's cat, right? Because if you make a change in the system, you can no longer know how it operates. And the second one, well, let's, let's, let's ask TechCrunch. 
a couple years ago, I think that was uh, what March 2011, they decided to go for Facebook comments, and uh, they did this to cut down on trolls and, and so on and so forth. And they were getting about a thousand comments per article a day. A couple days later, Facebook comments have silenced the trolls, but is it too silent? And they had a lot of issues, like, why isn't anybody commenting anymore? They're all using Facebook, and it should be better, right? And after a long deliberation on January 22nd of last month, <laughs> commenters, we want you back. They wound up going to a system called LiveFire, which basically, it, it allows you to use Facebook. It also allows you to use Twitter and Google or TechCrunch's database and things like that. So they actually gave people a lot more choices, and it turned out, as you can see, 954 comments on that article. So that helped them get that better. So the thing that I want to point out here, though, is that if TechCrunch had researched this a little bit, they would have discovered that Disgust did a similar case study about a year before that. And Disgust is a similar, it's kind of this plug-in thing where you can have users leave comments through it. And they have about 60 million users. It's kind of hard to see on the slide, but the, the capstone here, pseudonyms are the most valuable contributors to communities because they contribute the highest quantity and quality of comments. And they determine quality by, has it been flagged for spam, has it been upvoted, replied to, things like that. And uh, the, let's see here. Here's a nice visual graphic. The green are pseudonyms, the red are quote unquote real names, and the middle are uh, anonymous users. So you can see 61% were pseudonyms. So that's a lot of quantity, right? And that little bar graph up at the top, it's kind of hard to see, but on the left, it's segmented in three parts. On the left side, you have positive, middle is neutral, and on the right is negative. So the interesting thing, um, on the top there, the green part, 61% positive comments from uh, pseudonymous users. Whereas on the, the bottom, the red one, which is the real names, 51%. So they actually found that not only did they get more comments, but they had more quality, quality comments from it all. So something to think about. And th there's another question that comes up, well, what if people just don't use names at all? So there's actually a social network that launched in December of last year called Social Number. And what it does, it allows you to like, log in and create an account, pick in a number, not a name. And as you can see here, people are leaving. This one is like, what do you do? Uh, or, or suggest can be done to handle like, some other problem. Or, or so. And the signature to it is not a name, but it is a number. And there's a distinction I want to make here, because there's a lot of confusion as to what pseudonymy and uh, anonymity is. And this, I don't actually think this is anonymous. I believe that it is pseudonymous. People are choosing numbers because all the numbers are different, which means that it does not anonymize, it dehumanizes. And that's a very important distinction. And uh, so something else, I, I'll, I created a profile on here to see how it worked. Check this out. This is the account settings profile. And notice they have like uh, education and year if you went to school. So they say education and year, but not the name of your school. And then fast forward down a little bit, you got the, your uh, work experience, how many years, maybe what your title is, the skills that you have, but not the place of your work. So it's all the typical things that we would find in a social network, all the names are moved. And uh, here's an example of a post on there, ironically about anonymous. And you can, you can look, look at that, it's, it's a typical post, somebody's blabbering on, and they have an avatar, a picture they've uploaded, and the name is simply a number. So, I mean, this just launched a couple months ago, so it's hard to say how the effects, of, whether it will be successful, whether people will use it, how it will be used, but just something to consider that there are efforts into this. Myth number three, we can't trust anyone who uses their legal name online. And uh, trust, that, that's such a tricky word, isn't it? So here's a couple examples. Uh, my friend Violet Blue, she's a sex positive tech writer and among, among other things. She uh, wound up having a fight and she finally did get her uh, name verified because there was an impersonator, somebody else using the same name. And Twitter has this thing, that, that little triangle that you see there, the, 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 the blue check mark, it's verified identity. Have you guys seen this on Twitter before, by the way? Some people have it. Well, it turns out that there are ways to fool people and this Twitter account on the right here, that is a fake Twitter account created for just, just uh, Judge Denise Lind, Lind, who is presiding over, I think, the Bradley Manning pretrial. And somebody actually created an account with her photo and her name and started posting all this stuff about how the Obama administration is forcing her to like do all these bad things. And, and you know, there's a whole bunch of people who are overjoyed to see this. And they're like, how do we know this is true? And they started asking that, and then the whole, that, that little uh, image showed up on her profile, but it turned out that somebody actually edited the background of their Twitter page uh, to add the, uh, the verification in. So. so here's some other examples you guys have probably seen before. This is a CAPTCHA, how do I know that the person who's access logging in is a human or not? Uh, this is a key, basically a key sign-in log if you have a GPG key or a PGP. 
how do people trust you? Well, they sign your key, right? Well, and it creates a social network. So this is kind of a way that you can tell somebody is trustworthy. In this case, my uh, late friend, Len Sassaman, how many people trust them? And it, there's some issues with that, but in general, it's at least one tool that we can try to use to get there. Another one, you can see on the left, you have SSL certs, and on the right, you have, uh, what if somebody's being a dick on Reddit? Well, how do I know they're not a sock puppet? How do I know they didn't just create that account and log in and do something? Well, they got a whole bunch of uh, karma. So people have uploaded their comments, and this stuff is verified. So there are symbols that we can use to kind of verify whatever the word verify means. It's a way that we can establish trust within a community or social system. Except when you try to turn it into a business. <laughs> have anybody heard about clout? Does anybody know how the fuck clout works? Because I don't, and all those people, including a Wired article on the DuckDuckGo search for it, don't either. In fact, there's one headline, nobody gives a damn about your clout score. What the clout score is, it, it in theory goes through all these social networks and gives you a number between zero and 100 based on how your clout is or your reputation or your influence, but they don't tell you how it works. 100 is Justin Bieber. What's that? Oh, 100 is Justin Bieber, okay. So, you're right. So, yes, when, when you have, what's that? So they can game it for sale. Right, so they can game it for sale. And when you open the stuff up for commerce, shit like that happens, right? So, you know, maybe they'll be around, maybe they'll be more transparent, but at the moment, it's kind of a joke to me. So, um, I'm running short on time. How much time do I have left, by the way? What? 20, okay, good, good, good. So, um, I'll, I'll just, I'll keep this kind of short. There, there's some interesting things. If you see a question on here that sticks out to you, just come with me afterwards and ask about it. And some of these questions have no answers, by the way. Some of them are just rhetorical. But quick poll here. How many people here have a Facebook account? Okay, keep your hands up. How many of you have your job posted on Facebook? Okay, and of those, how many have your salary posted? Yeah, so what is transparency, right? Myth number four, we can trust identity providers like Google and Facebook. <laughs> yeah, good one, Adam. So let's look for a couple of quotes just to historically here. Eric Schmidt, executive chairman at Google, you all may have heard of him. So the first quote here, the only way to manage this is true, by this he means online identity, is true transparency and no anonymity. In a world of asynchronous threats, it's too dangerous for there not to be some way to identify you. We need a verified name service for people. Governments will demand it. This is why I'm getting involved in NISTIC, and you guys should too. And uh, the next one, oh, check this out. If you have something that you don't want anyone to know, you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Glad to see that he is the arbiter of morality. Yeah. What? Oh, it's at the top. Yeah, yeah, it's at the top. Um, yeah, so if you want this guy to dictate what you can do in the bedroom, there you go. So now we have King Zuckerberg, CEO at Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> the days of you having a different image for your work friends or coworkers, and for the other people you know are probably coming to an end pretty quickly. Having two identities for yourself is an example of a lack of integrity. So that's Zuckerberg talking about integrity. That was before his sister got compromised, yeah. This, this is, so my favorite, of course, is Chris Poole, founder of 4chan. There's success kid there. Uh, saw the school bully working at McDonald's. Yeah. The portrait of identity online is often painted in black and white. Who you are online is who you are offline. Identity doesn't work that way, online or offline. It's not who you share with, it's who you share as, and thus one of the thesis points of my talk, identity is prismatic. So just to do a quick recap for uh, the Google NIM Wars stuff, and by the way, NIM Wars, all of our accounts got suspended and a bunch of people fought back against Google and that was called NIM Wars uh, because people were fighting to keep their, their, the, the names that they had chosen on Google. And Google had this thing called name-shaped names as well. It's actually still unclear what their policies are, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. And uh, the, the quick chronology, there's some confusion and they requested my government issued ID. I'm still not sure why or what they're gonna do with that. I never sent it to them and please, anytime anybody asks you for a government issued ID, ask them what law requires it. Because if there's a law requiring it, there's probably a legal procedure for using it too. And just something to think about. And uh, I, I started asking them some hard questions and my account suddenly got reinstated. <laughs> and then two weeks later, it got suspended again. So I wasn't alone. Uh, Violet Blue, who we just saw in the Twitter thing, she was also suspended. Uh, there's my friend Sai. He's a legal mononym. That's his driver's license. His full legal name is SAI. So there have been some updates and changes to this. So they, the new policy, you can change your name, but it's limited to three times every two years, not sure why. You can appeal 
And one of the elements of the appeal, besides uh, sending in an ID, if you can demonstrate that you have a significant following, whatever that means. They also have what's called a nicknames policy, which I thought was interesting, because you may have heard that Google said that they were going to allow pseudonyms. Uh, some of you might have seen that. Well, this is what it looks like. This is their idea of pseudonyms. You have the first name and the last name, and then the nickname blank. And then it says display name as. And notice that the display name, it can either be your first and last name, first nickname, last name, or first, last, and then your nickname. When the entire point, to me, of using pseudonyms or any kind of online ID is to have the ability to separate contexts, this defeats the whole fucking point of that. So just food to think about. By, by the way, Google cares about this so much, they've actually filed and been granted a patent for this as of uh, September 18th of last year. And you can see up there, the, there's uh, the, you know, the, the, the name, it's like Sarah Johnson, and then the different nicknames, the personas you can have. At least they use the word persona. So here's, you guys may have seen this if you try to log into YouTube or something like that. This is where we're going right now. And notice how it says, would you like to use your full name on YouTube or on whatever service it is? And there's the button down there that says, I don't want to use my full name. Oh, okay, great. Well, and look at this. It comes up with this thing. It says, All the, uh, are you sure you don't want to use your uh, full name? Why not? And you got these options. My channel is a, 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 for a show or a character. My channel is for a, a music artist or a, or a group. Or you know, I, I, my channel is for personal use, but I cannot use my full name. All these other things. And it's, well, let, let's see here. Does this remind you guys of anything? There's a lack of transparency. There's procedures and policies that make absolutely no sense. And they seem to change around kind of sporadically. Remind you guys of anything? TSA, <laughs> opt-in out, still opt-in out, let us know why. It violates my constitutional rights, it conflicts, or it violates my religious beliefs, I don't want cancer. My favorite, of course, it simply does not fucking work. <laughs> uh, yeah, I spent like an hour making that in Photoshop because I thought it was funny. <laughs> so uh, apologies if it sucks. So. This is what I call Google's method. We saw earlier in the talk the uh, suggested method for my spec for online ID. This is the way Google is doing it. You have the real name, which you saw in the patent, and then you have the uh, hierarchy, right? Hierarchy is very important here. The, the top level and the lower level of pseudonyms. Uh, by the way, does anybody know the etymology of the word legitimate? It comes from legitimare, which is Latin for to make lawful. It shares roots with the words law, legal, legislate, things like that. So if you think about the context of it, um, if you call something legitimate, what is it that you're really saying? Well, it's for legal use, of course. And the capstone on this, labels give someone else power over you. I believe there's a great deal of power involved in all of this. And by the way, Facebook is not innocent in this. If you guys saw this, this is in September, this is called Snitchgate. Basically, this pops up and the text on here says, please help us understand how people are using Facebook. Your response is anonymous, blah, blah, blah. It says, is this your friend's real name? And they're like, yes, no, I don't know this person, blah, blah, blah. It's asking people to snitch on their friends. So, and the, the, they, Facebook took that down after a while. They claimed it was just a test thing. I'm like, what kind of collective jest alt are we getting at? What kind of institution is Facebook trying to create with this, right? And the institution, that word again. So this just happened like two weeks ago. Did anyone see this, the Instagram shit? Remember Instagram is that, like the hipster photo website thing? Where you download the app on your iPhone, you could become a hipster and have you know, vintage colors and things. They got bought by Facebook for a billion dollars, and just a couple weeks ago they did this thing where they are suspending users' accounts, and under the terms of the impersonation policy, it actually says here that, um, that in order to get their accounts back, they have to send in their government issued ID. So, one, one thing I want to share, by the way, this, this is in the guidelines of um, Instagram's impersonation accounts thing. It says that they want two clear photographs of different angles on the government issues IDs. And there's this nice little link there that says submit the following information. Okay, I'll go ahead and click that and submit my ID. Wait, there's no SSL? <laughs> so j just, just insult to injury there. So this is the state of things right now. This happened like two weeks ago. And if you want to keep using these services and they keep doing it, this is why people need to speak up basically and say, here's what I think. And if you disagree with me, that's okay because we want to have a public discourse about all of this. And just a, a few more questions for thought. Who are Google and Facebook trying to impress? Who else might have access to this data? I have no fucking clue. And of course, why would Chewbacca, an eight foot tall Wookiee, want to live on an indoor with a bunch of two foot tall Ewoks? By the way, um, Chewbacca would have been suspended under Google's real names policy. Just, just. Yeah, so let, let's, uh, our last myth from uh, Adam here, we're currently fixing this through, okay, 10 minutes left. Wow, great, okay. We're currently fixing this through legislation. 
So um, uh, yeah, this, this South Korea did this uh, back in 2003. Actually, do I have 10 minutes left for the talk total? OK. And, until it hits the 4 o'clock part? OK. Good to know. So, so um, uh, South Korea, the real name verification law, this was passed in 2003 in response to some issues they were having around the election and people leaving snarky comments on web forums and such. They, resident uh, re registration number is similar to a social security number in a sense. And they repealed this last year after the KCC, the Korea Communications Commission, discovered there was a 0.9% change in quality. They determined quality by um, basically curse words that they were used. They had a list of about 50 or 60 curse words. And also, psychologists will appreciate this, they had this thing called anti-normative behavior. So I guess going against the grain or something like that, it, it's kind of unclear what it was. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, Carnegie Mellon University did a follow-up study. It's very, very enlightening. But they repeal it because 0 0.9, statistical significance is 5% or greater. And they, they didn't even have that. So it turns out that pushing a certain type of name on people may Maybe they're douchebags to begin with, right? Like the Violent Takers guy. So here's something that just happened December 28th of 2012. Uh, China passed this law, strengthening network internet protection. And this is all, you may have seen this in the news, where China basically passed this law requiring people to register their uh, legal names on, in order to use the uh, internet. And you can see here I bulleted it. Hand, so, ha, Network service providers that handle website access services use for users handle fixed telephone, mobile t telephone, and I like this, other surfing formalities. It's a really strange phrasing. I mean, maybe it's lost in translation because it was originally a Chinese law, but I'm not sure what a surfing formality is. And at the end there, require users to provide real identity information. So uh, what else is going on? Oh yeah, California, man, we're just sucking right now. We had Prop 8, now we have Prop 35. Uh, Prop 8 was to ban gay marriage, by the way. In Prop 35, California is against sexual exploitation, and this was passed as of the last election. Section 290.014, Section B, if any person who is required to register pursuant to the act, and th 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 that, that is anybody who's a sex offender, basically, adds or changes his or her account with an internet service provider ad or adds or changes an internet identifier, is required to send that uh, notification of this to law enforcement within 24 hours of said registration. Interesting, isn't that? How easy is that to enforce? Anyone think that's easy to enforce? <laughs> right, so it's, it's worth noting that the day after November 7th, the EFF uh, filed a lawsuit against that. Yay, EFF! And uh, an injunction was granted as of January 11th of this year. Um, it, it's worth noting, by the way, that I in the injunction grant, one of the uh, cases that was cited is the case McIntyre versus Ohio Elections Commission from 1995. And th there's basically like three or four cases or, or case, uh, case law period in the United States regarding anonymity. If you look for, on Wikipedia for Anonymous, they, they have this section on case law. And that's, I think, the most recent. The others are from the 40s and 50s, or 50s and 60s or something. And the thing that I really like, I think it was Justice John Paul Stevens who said this, but one of the, the uh, the remarks in the injunction, like the, the, the leading things in, not the injunction, but the 1995 case law, the quote, anonymity is a shield from the tyranny of the majority. I look at Publius, right? That's what our country is based on and founded on. So Germany has it right. They have this thing called the Telemedia Act. It was passed in 2007, section 13, subsection six. The service provider must enable the use of telemedia and payment for them to occur via anonymous or occur anonymously or via a pseudonym. So Germany actually has codified into law that you must be able to use pseudonyms on the internet. And this has run into some issues of Facebook. They're currently in a lawsuit with this right now because the German government sued Facebook because of the real names policy. It's going to be real interesting to see how this happens because one of the issues we're running into here is corporations can set policies, right? But we also have law, and law is agreed upon by the people. In theory, we have represented democracy, right? And what happens when what corporations want to do interferes with the written law of the land? At what point does that inter oh, shit. at what point does that intersection meet? And that's something I, I think this is going to become a bigger and bigger and bigger issue as more things come online. And this is why all of you guys should get involved in NISTIC. What's that? Oh, Germany lost that case. Yeah, Interesting. Said that, that the German law actually says, uh, Facebook is not sitting in Germany. Interesting. Okay, so they said it's not German law because Facebook is not sitting in Germany. So that was the day before yesterday? Okay, I was getting drunk at Schmuckon. I missed that news. <laughs> <laughs>
And uh, wow, that's, that's fascinating, because like this juxtapose, we have a legal institution which you know, pe people vote, you know. You can't vote for Facebook, can you? What? What's that? Oh yes, you can elect not to use it, which is why I don't. So They call it lichen, yeah, okay. So basically some final notes, I'm just about done, probably getting kicked off here soon, but I want everyone, nimrights.org is the URL, you can join it, we have a mailing list. Um, I'll also be up at LobbyCon if you guys want to chat more after this. Also, anyone can join, uh, IDESG is Identity Ecosystem Steering Group, it's kind of the, the group that's formed around trying to enact the uh, initiatives behind NISTIC. And, um, what? <laughs> I'm registered as aesthetic, so fuck that. <laughs> I actually, what? I still period. yeah, they require a last name, and a period works as a last name, right? Or a space sometimes. But uh, if you think about how that all goes, yeah. So if you're worried about not wanting your legal name to be in involved in something like this, I, I think I'm the first pseudonym actually to be an official member of NISTIC, so. Right, in fact, no, I, I took this screenshot last night to just, you know, demonstrate it. It turned out there was somebody else, Snertly, I don't know who that is, but yay, apparently they saw my, my Twitter pleas for it, and they went ahead and registered with a mononym. So, we're making a difference. So, uh, that's it. Any questions? Question, do I have time for, how many questions do I have time for? Five minutes, okay, I'll take three questions. One. Okay. Uh, I'll have to check that out. So what was it? There's an identity talk on identity and network protocols. Yeah. Do you know who's giving it? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. When is it? I want to announce it. So. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So it's a talk at 10 a.m. So, um, what's that? <laughs> Who? David Pisano. Okay. So go David. Wow. That takes, uh, Good for him for getting up so early. I, I will attempt to, and everyone else, you should try your best to uh, stay up all night. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, Bobcat or Spring Trading, what's the name Oh, oh, great, cool. Say hi to Bobcat, or I guess I'm, I've got the mic, so hi, Bobcat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, is Bobcat his real name? Yes, question in the back. You are a threat to national security if you are just Sally Sue, who, if you're not using your real name to exchange information like recipes on the internet, you are a fucking threat to national security. It, it'll take ten, 10 years to attack you, though. What's up? It's a good pie. Uh, it's, it's a good pie, okay. Do you feel that it's necessary for someone like that to go out of their way to make a pseudonym or a handle or whatever it is? Or for, for someone who isn't doing something wrong? So somebody who is staying totally within the law, not doing anything wrong according to social standards and norms, is, there, is it necessary for them to have a pseudonym? Is that what you're asking? I think it depends on the context they're in. Right, it's Sally Sue's own, in, in my opinion, people have the right to choose their own names, yes. Okay. Okay. Right, right. Um, and, and I think people have like this idea of, oh, we're not going to figure out who he is, or it's going to be impossible to find him, therefore we want to keep him as an unknown. Mm -hmm. so that's a fantastic question. I'm so glad you asked that. Okay, so let me repeat the question um, just to make sure I have it right. Uh, somebody like the Violent Acres guy, if they're not, if their legal name is not known, how do we build an accountability, right? Like. It, it, if somebody's doing something illegal or amoral, dependent on the social standards of morality, how do we find them? Um, so, two answers to that. Uh, fantastic question. The first is that if you're using the internet, there's a bunch of ways to find who you are. You could use it by IP address and access times. I, I, I can get more technical, but, I mean, how many people here know how to find somebody if you don't know their name? So, it is possible. You got a bunch of geeks around here who uh, are happy to help uh, enforce good, right? Um, on the other hand, and I'm going to cite William Binney here, who's the NSA whistleblower, and in his talk he gave a keynote at the Hackers on Planet Earth conference last year, and he said that names are a really bad way to identify who somebody is. How many Dave Browns are there in the world, right? 
And if somebody is, uh, how many, if you have a, a, a like 10 Dave Browns, how many of them are going to start look, using nicknames or pseudonyms and a unique identifier? There's other ways, like uh, habitual patterns, like the, the schedule somebody keeps, where they work, things like that. There's all kinds of ways you can identify somebody. And IP address is one of them. Uh, 4chan has actually run into issues with this. Uh, one of the things that Chris Poole has spoken out about is making sure that if somebody posts child pornography or something illegal on a 4chan and slash B, that they make sure that due process comes to them. So, does that answer your question? Okay. It, we can talk more. It's, yes. Andy, what are you really up to? What am I really up to? <laughs> yes, Binky, I'm trying to take over the world. <laughs> All right. Yes. Oh, one question left. I, I want to get out of the way for the next speaker. Yes. What is the motivation of companies like Google? What is the motivation of companies like... Your real name? Right. If they can figure out who you are just by your behavior. We should talk at LobbyCon about that, because that's like another hour-long discussion. All right. I think I'm out of time. Uh, I'm going to get kicked off here in a second. Thank you guys so much. And uh, <laughs> yes.